Hello and welcome back to the Goodness Lover Show. Today we'll be talking all about leaky gut. What is it? How do you diagnose it? What does it cause in your body? And so much more. We'll be sitting down with Dr. Liz Lipsky, who has a PhD in clinical nutrition, is multiple board certified, author of many books on gut health, digestive wellness, and peer-reviewed journals. So she has a wealth of experience. She's been studying this for decades. So I hope you enjoy the wisdom that she imparts to us today. Let's get into it. Dr. Liz Lipsky, we are so excited for you to join us on the show. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's always fun to be with the two of you. <laughs> Great. Well, um, you've um, been talking about the microbiome probably around the same time that we were in nappies. Yes. So <laughs> I feel <laughs> last time we had a Q&A with our community, you were just like, so yeah, in the 90s. And we were just like, what year did you start learning about the microbiome? You're like early 90s. <laughs> right. Yeah. We were barely just, um, we we're just getting our numbers right at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so you have so much to share. And we're very excited. And actually, um, you're featuring a lot in our upcoming docuseries, The Gut Immune Solution. So yeah. that's very exciting. So uh, you have so much to share, really. And we know our community loves learning more about leaky gut. And I'm um, gathering from all those, you know, decades of experience of, you know, Diving into the microbiome, you've got some exciting things to share. So let's start off. Um, when did you first start learning about leaky gut? Is it something that's been around for a long time or is it was you were just, you know, when the microbiome was, you know, the, I guess the, you know, all the, everyone was geeking out at the microbiome at the same time and it came up then. When did you first hear about leaky gut? Again, when you were little kids. So <laughs> um, the term leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability came across my attention in the early 1990s. And the term leaky gut syndrome was actually coined by Dr. Stephen Barry, who was the first owner of what's now Genova Diagnostic Labs. And he, he founded that laboratory and he he in the lab used to have these wonderful conferences and he dubbed it leaky gut. Um, so that's where that term came from. And in 1998, I wrote a little booklet that's still available on leaky gut. It was my second book. Awesome. So what inspired you to, uh, obviously you learned about it at these conferences and then you were like, okay, I've got to write a book on this. What, what was, what was so interesting about it? What were you seeing? Were you seeing it in practice when you were dealing with patients that this was a really, a really a common thing? What was the story behind that? It is a really common thing. And when you start recognizing it in people, then it's one of those pattern recognition pieces that you go, aha, I see this in this person sitting in front of me and we know what to do with it. And I think it's so critically important. I was listening to Dr. Wendy Romig and your interview with her before we got on. Um, she's a former student of mine and a colleague. And, and, you know, when digestion doesn't work right, nothing works right. And the small intestine specifically, it's a got a dual function. And its function is, is to take food molecules and other molecules that come in with our food and bring those into the body so that the cells can use them. And then its other function is just opposite of that. It's paradoxical. It's like, no, you don't get to come through. You're too big or you're too toxic or you're too inflammatory. You don't get to come through. And so when that barrier, which is really the barrier from kind of outer digestion, which is it's it, we've eaten it, but it's not in our bloodstream yet. It's still in that kind of digestive hose that's our intestines. Um, once it comes into the body, into the bloodstream, then we have a whole different relationship with those molecules. And that's where they can cause a lot of inflammation and can have really systemic effects. Mm. So before you mentioned that you now see the pattern in so many of your patients, what would you say is the telltale signs 
of uh, leaky gut that you commonly see? Um, one would be lots of food sensitivities, environmental sensitivities, looking at um, skin issues. So people with eczema, psoriasis, um, other kind of skin rashes, hives, um, looking for people who just feel fatigued, brain fog, um, people with autoimmune conditions, you can pretty much assume that they at least started with leaky gut. Pretty much every single autoimmune disease that has been stutter studied, people had increased intestinal permeability. So when you start looking at that, and when we look at graphs of autoimmune conditions, just globally, they're just skyrocketing. And so this barrier, it's only one molecule thick. Crazy. So when this barrier gets breached, it's it it causes lots of disruption everywhere in the body. And um, sometimes even if you've got somebody with a lot of arthritis or fibromyalgia or migraines, again, you start looking at that and you go, huh, could that just be a partially leaky gut? And I think you also always have to look at leaky gut in context with um the microbiome too, and what the balance of the microbiome are. They're kind of a right hand and left hand that work together, or they're a Matt and Sarah that work together. <laughs> so sometimes dysfunctionally or? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes dysfunctionally, but mostly functionally. <laughs> cool. uh, I, I think it'd be great to, uh, you mentioned arthritis just now, and I know that a lot of our community do struggle with arthritis or sore joints. I would be interested to know if you have any stories, I guess, of uh, someone that had issues with this and you discovered leaky gut and, um, and their story. Okay. So I, I think about this one, I mean, I think about lots of different clients, but I think about this one woman who came to see me, she was in her fifties and she had a lot of fatigue, but mostly her main complaint was arthritis in her knees, in her shoulders, in her back, her hips. And, and uh, we didn't even run any testing. All we did was an elimination type diet um, that was gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, sugar-free, alcohol-free. And so she was pretty much eating fruits, vegetables, um, easy to digest oils, um, chicken, poultry, um, and non-gluten containing grains, things like quinoa and millet, um, brown rice. And within a couple weeks, her joints felt amazingly better. And that was without really any supplementation or anything. I also remember this client it was so funny because she was an engineer. And so we did food sensitivity testing and we found her food sensitivity reactions that were high and she eliminated those foods out of her diet and her arthritis disappeared. But because she was an engineer, she's like, I don't understand this. So <laughs> I'm gonna add these foods back in and see what happens. And she did, and then she felt worse again. And she did this two or three times until she really grokked it. And she's like, yeah, like, okay, I see it. I still don't understand it, but I see how it works in my own body. Um, because it doesn't really make that much sense when you think about it, that that a leaky gut would lead, lead to food sensitivities make sense, but that food sensitivities would lead to arthritis it's kind of like why does that work and it's because what happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut it goes everywhere and so that inflammation depending on your own genetic predisposition can really go anywhere can you just zoom i, I love that little statement it doesn't just stay in the gut it goes everywhere can you just explain because maybe there's some other engineers listening to this going this doesn't <laughs> make sense so can you explain more about that how does that work you know, I wish I understood better. I don't think anybody really totally understands the mechanisms of that. I don't. Um, 
or how does it lead to a migraine headache? I, I don't understand. But what we do know is that when somebody has leaky gut, they often have other leaky tissues. Mm -hmm. So leaky heart, leaky blood brain barrier, which is why sometimes we'll get depression or anxiety or, or people will start feeling, um, uh, you know, a brain fog when they, when they're experiencing it or, or it can go to the joints. Um, the brain is really a, a big one, but, leaky lungs. Uh, we see when people have leaky gut, they often have leaky lungs. And so asthma and allergies are worse. It, it just doesn't stay there. And I think that some of the mechanisms is that, let's say that I eat eggs and I'm really sensitive to eggs and I have a leaky gut. And so those egg molecules pass into the bloodstream. So just like any cells, the cells of the small intestine should be really tight together. Mm -hmm. But let's say that I slam my thumb with a hammer, it's going to swell and these swell and they push apart. And that can allow molecules to go through and the the mechanisms of these are many we have occludin and other and claudins different types of occludins and claudins that work really hard to keep those junctions really tight together because when molecules that don't that aren't small get through then what happens is that i eat that egg and those egg molecules go into my bloodstream and they're not fully digested and there's no way to digest them once they're in the blood. And so there aren't digestive enzymes. So what happens is the immune system says, hey, there's foreign stuff here. It doesn't belong here. And we start an inflammatory cascade because that's the immune system's job to recognize things that don't belong and get rid of them. And so the, the way the body produces inflammation is really nondescript in a lot of ways. We've got cytokines and um, interleukins and and uh, cosinoids, and but they're the same everywhere in the body. It doesn't matter where they're in your little toe or in your gut or in your brain. They're the same molecules. And so once inflammation starts, that inflammation can be picked up pretty much everywhere. Mm. Interesting. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah, that's a really cool explanation. And so there's this little tight junction that stands between us and the rest of the world. And it seems like this little battle over that, that small little gap um, that's, you know, protecting us from, you know, you know, our body's doing its job has been under attack. What are some of the contributing factors that you believe have driven like things like leaky gut going, you know, and autoimmune diseases going up? Is there a, is it a certain type of lifestyle factor? Is it environmental toxins? What is it? I think it's a combination of so many things. Stress is a huge one. Okay, stress, antibiotics really change the microbiome and can really lead to this. Some of the huge uh, disruptors are NSAIDs, things like aspirin and ibuprofen. Um, how they work is they actually work on prostaglandins and they block prostaglandins so that we don't have pain, but those prostaglandins are also blocked at a place where we can't do repair. And the gut lining, this barrier, replaces itself every three to five days. So, you know, if you're taking an occasional, you know, NSAID because you have some kind of pain somewhere, it's not a big deal. But when people are taking them daily, then we're really blocking the healing of that. Um, steroid medications like prednisone, cortisone uh, have a bad effect on it. Um, even women's menstrual cycles sometimes, um, high sp spikes of prednisone, or, uh, sorry, sorry, progesterone, end of a long day, um, progesterone <laughs> um, uh, can have an effect on gut barrier function. So sometimes even oral contraceptives can be something that can be uh, 
lead to this. Um, drinking too much alcohol, everyday chemicals that we're exposed to, which we're all exposed to so many everyday chemicals, um, bad diets, you know, eating a standard, highly processed food diet can contribute to it. So, you know, all the things that we not getting enough sleep, you know, um, not getting enough exercise, getting too much exercise, you know, all the things that we know already um, are the things that contribute to it. When we have leaky gut, we can also have malabsorption because there's this thin mucus layer in the gut um, that's filled with microbes in the you know, and that's part of the microbiome, and we can call that the the um, biofilm layer or the mucus layer, and it can be ordered or it can be disordered. Mm -hmm. And when it's disordered, then the mucus lining can change, and then we can also have malabsorption at the same time that we have leaky gut. And so we can have big molecules coming through and then we can have essential ones not being able to get through that mucus layer. Mm. Well, that is not a good situation. You that think? is not good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. So you're say, say you see someone in your clinical practice and you're seeing the telltale signs of leaky gut, or maybe you've done a test for it. You can see it on your paperwork. What's your first steps? Um, what in all your years, of experience, I'm sure you've kind of honed in how you approach this. And, um, and I, I'm sure you're like, not every patient is the same. So it might be tricky to answer a little bit, but what are your go-to steps? Okay. So other people might disagree with this, but I remember telling this to a colleague of mine a long time ago. And I said, you know, I don't test for it. If I suspect it, we just go ahead and we work with it. That said, there are some people who really need to see it in black and white before they're actually willing to do anything. Mm. And so sometimes if you've got somebody who says, show me, then you can do testing. But otherwise, if you've been a clinician for a long time, you start seeing some of the pieces of it, and then you can start saying, well, let's just go ahead and look at it. And, you know, for a long time, the only test that we really had was called a lactulose mannitol test. And basically there are two sugars. Lactulose is a really large molecule and the mannitose is really small. And so you drink this lactulose mannitol solution and then you capture the urine. You would expect that if something's already um, been absorbed in your bloodstream, and then it gets filtered by your kidneys and then it comes out in your urine, then you'd be able to see what's there. And what you would expect to see is a lot of the mannitol, which the molecules are really small. You hope that you're not gonna see much lactulose because the molecules are really big. And that would indicate that there's leaky gut. But if you see really high levels of lactulose, which is the big molecule, and really low levels of mannitol, then you suspect that there's not only leaky gut, but also malabsorption because they couldn't even get the mannitol in mm. to their bloodstream. So what in an optimal situation, you see really high levels of the mannitol, low levels of the lactulose. So that test has been used for over 30 years in research centers and teaching hospitals to look for leaky gut. Now we have newer tests that look for it and there's different markers. So you can look for zonulin, or zonulin antibodies. And zonulin antibodies, I think, is a much more exact way to look for leaky gut. Um, the main reasons why we have elevated zonulin levels are because we have celiac disease or we have a gluten sensitivity. Um, and those are really the main reasons why zonulin levels go up. Mm -hmm. So, you could test for zonulin and not see anything if gluten isn't your issue. Mm -hmm. So they also look for something called lipopolysaccharides, bacterial lipopolysaccharides. These don't come from food. And they're mostly from what we call gram-negative bacteria, which are a lot of the bacteria that make us feel worse. Um, and, and these lipopolysaccharides 
open up those tight junctions. And so again, looking for the amount of them or looking for the antibodies for those lipopolysaccharides can be a really good indicator of what you're looking for. So those are kind of newer tests. So that's kind of how we look for it. But I just usually look for those symptoms that we talked about earlier. And then I start thinking about what's basic, okay? So what's basic is our brain and our muscles run on glucose, but our small intestine runs on glutamine. Glutamine is the most abundant free amino acid in the body. And so I'll start loading somebody up with glutamine until they get constipated from it. <laughs> um, and then I know we overdid. Um, and I'll just have people take powdered glutamine and put it in a water bottle mm -hmm. and just drink that throughout the day, you know, five grams, 10 grams to really start getting it um, to heal up that gut. Um, that's my number one go-to unless somebody's had a lot of cancer or cancer because glutamine can enhance tumor growth. Mm. So there's a caveat there. Um, and sometimes I'll use a, glu a glutamine product that's got alpha ketoglutarate in it, which is an organic acid that lets glutamine recycle itself over and over and over again. And so in doing that, you can use kind of low dose, maybe only three grams of glutamine and get the benefits of 10 or 15 grams of glutamine in a day. Um, I'll often use glutamine too when there's muscle wasting. You know, as people age and they're losing muscle or if somebody's been sick for a long time, long COVID or something, and they've really lost a lot of weight or post-surgery um, is also another good time to think about using glutamine. So that would be my number one go-to. I also love using quercetin. Quercetin helps heal leaky gut. Um, it's also a mast cell inhibitor, so can be very useful. It's normally found in apples and onions and things that are in really small amounts, but it's a natural substance that we find in a lot of food. And then I like demulcents. I like things that are really soothing to the gut. So things like slippery elm and marshmallow root and, um, trying to think of some other important ones. Those are the main ones. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so those are the main things that I think of for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways to approach it. And then you also have to look at the person's lifestyle. Like what are they doing that is contributing to this? Where are their main stressors? Do, how did they relax and rest? What brings them joy and pleasure? You know, how can we add more joy and pleasure into somebody's life? Um, you know, um, we have studies on acupuncture and leaky gut and studies on yoga and meditation and leaky gut. So, you know, what's going to speak to this person and what can they change in their lifestyle that helped give them the leaky gut in the first place? And then you always have to change somebody's diet. So I'm glad you mentioned those lifestyle factors like... Uh, meditation, yoga, because, um, and it's so great that there's been studies done on them because I think uh, when it comes to those lifestyle practices, I think it's harder to maybe prioritize them because it doesn't feel as necessarily as scientific or I guess we've been programmed over time to think the best thing I can do, I guess, is change my diet and t potentially take supplements. We're programmed to take pills and think that's going to change my health, but we don't necessarily think these other practices also change your health in such a dramatic way. Um, I guess, could you speak to those practices or I guess the element of self-care that's so important um, with, with digestive health? So, you know, so often I think the reason why we go see clinicians is because something's wrong and that's really great. But I think prevention is hard to sell. Mm -hmm. When we feel good, we kind of feel like, oh, everything's going really great. And when it comes crashing down, then we ask for help. But I think in either situation, it's so important to really put ourselves on the list. It's so easy to put children and work and other people in your lives, parents and 
other people who need you on your list. And it's so hard to sometimes put yourself on that list as just needing a break. I was talking to somebody the other day and she was like, oh, you know, I'm just so exhausted and I'm starting to get anxiety attacks. And it's like, well, yeah, you've got three kids and you work full time. So, you know, when was the last time you went out dancing? When was the last, which is something she loves. When was the last time you and your husband actually like got a babysitter and went out yourselves? Yeah. When was the last time you took a walk without your kids? You know, so sometimes we know the answers, but we don't give ourselves permission to prioritize ourselves because everybody else seems more, more important. And that's true for men and women, you know, and it's, it's like, so give yourself permission to be on the list. And my self care, it's something I take seriously. I get up in the morning, I work out and do stretching and calisthenics for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, virtually every single morning. I'm careful about getting enough sleep. So I go to bed earlier than I really want to go. Mm -hmm. so that I know that I wake up rested. I make sure to go for walks a few times a week or do some kind of other, you know, dance class or something else. I prioritize shopping for really good foods and being careful about what I make in the house. I don't eat perfectly, but I prioritize, you know, eating healthful foods most of the time. And so, and I take my supplements, you know, when I was younger, I would space out taking my supplements all the time. Mm -hmm. And every time I would take one, I'd pat myself on the back and I go, <laughs> oh, good girl, you took them, you know, because they seemed kind of when I was young and it just seemed like so not important. Right. And, you know, but now I take my supplements and whatever drugs I need to take, I take a couple times a day and I prioritize that. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it, no matter what's, phase of life we're in, it's so important to say, I am worth it because we have so much research showing that if you just do simple things like eat more vegetables or eat a Mediterranean type of diet and get exercise and get enough sleep and don't smoke cigarettes, mm -hmm. that you'll live a longer, healthier life. I mean, it's not rocket science, mm -hmm. yet it's so hard to do because sometimes we feel like salmon swimming upstream because our friends are all doing these self-destructive behaviors. Right. Mm. Oh, so, so um, you know, and I think the way the medical system is set up, it's set up so that we rely on medicine and those of us who are listening to your podcast, we're interested in like, what can we do? How can we imp be empowered? How can we empower other people? And I think that starts with us of saying, I'm worth it and I'm gonna do it for myself first and be a role model and then, and not perfect, but I'm gonna do the best that I can knowing that I'm my, my balance is gonna wobble out of balance from time to time, absolutely. And that living in a human body, weird things are gonna happen but that you know that i do have power over this and i can work to prevent illness later so important thank you for sharing that that's really hit home and um i think that's a really poignant message it's actually definitely something i'm personally working on at the moment and i've put i'm particularly working on uh i guess practices to lower my stress because i know that's really just a thing for me at the moment. And, and then, so this whole conversation of self-care has been really, um, in the forefront of my mind and how can I make myself do this? And I've recently discovered more about my personality. We've been doing strength finders and all this sort of stuff. And, um, the suggestion for my personality type was to put actual self-care practices on your on my to-do list so I can actually tick it off, cross it off. So I actually feel okay about prioritizing it. Um, and so my friend, has been, I told my friend about it. She's been texting me. She's like, put put Jenny on your to-do list today. Go for a walk with Jenny and or like put on your to-do list, like spend time with Matt, ha have lunch mm. in the sun with Matt. And, you You've know. You've a massage. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You're lucky, like, you know. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, 
I think sometimes, yeah. So, so far that's been helping putting it on my to-do list. It takes away some of that guilt um, that I just by default, unfortunately feel when I'm looking after myself in those extra ways. So anyway, for any other achiever types like me out there, that might be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to put it in our calendar. Yeah. Just like any other event, you know, I'm going for a walk today, put it right there. We're going to go sit out in the sun. Matt, I'm going to give Matt a massage today. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, I think we should start scheduling this stuff. Yeah, this is, this yeah is I great. think we should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask my husband to start scheduling those for me too. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do go and get a massage at least once a month. That's mm. great something else you know it's just just one of those pieces i think it's for me body care is really important um and has been since i don't know the last 35 years at least awesome well if you're listening schedule it make yeah. it make it a priority because often other things are so much more a priority and you are worth it you right deserve is, it. you deserve yeah. it and if you're going to help other people what the whole thing of Put an oxygen mask on yourself before you put one on others mm. when in on, the a plane, plane. on a plane emergency. It's the same thing with our own health, right? We need to be in a good space ourselves before we can help others, which so many people get the other way around. So thank you so much for reminding um, us, of that. us of that, Liz. That's such an important factor. And and I think everything you've discussed around leaky gut, I've, hopefully people that have listened to the call have really gotten something, a new angle on it. And as I said, you've been studying this for so long. You've seen thousands upon thousands of patients that have I've gone through this. So thank you for just illuminating so many different aspects of leaky gut. I think it's been really interesting to dive deeper into that today. You're welcome. So if someone's listening going, wow, okay. So she's been studying the microbiome for a long time and I'd like to learn more from her or get more of her resources. Where is the best place for the people to find that? So people can go to my main website, which is innovativehealing.com. Um, my book is, my main book is Digestive Wellness. And there's also, I have an online course called The Art of Digestive Wellness. And you can go to artofdigestivewellness.com. Awesome. Wonderful. The great and names, by the way. I, I like that. Yeah. And uh, innovativehealing.com that was. And I think it's also really cool that you are a, um, you're a, I guess, what would you call it? A course director? A uh, curriculum developer i looked at your um course that you've designed at uh maryland university of integrative what's it what's it called <laughs> maryland university of integrative health yeah I'm oh it's close I'm i had the word skewed up. there and yeah. and uh we have certificate programs we just have a new culinary certificate we have for nurses and clinicians we have a wonderful like post bachelor's certificate uh, post master's certificate um and then we have master's programs and doctoral programs in nutrition so cool um and so it's been an honor to speak to you today dr liz i i um i we keep talking about how long you've been studying the microbiome it's like obviously there's a lot of practitioners that have been practicing for that amount of time but it's so rare to actually find someone that's been looking at the microbiome and digestive wellness and its impact on the rest of he health for so long because it's kind of become a thing in the last um i guess five to ten years where different technologies have really skyrocketed scientific interest so it's so cool to be talking to someone that has really been interested in this for so long and um and obviously have has been incorporating um all that you've learned with your clients as well so it's really been an honor to like delve into your wisdom a bit today and, and Liz can um, say like I, I was there before it was cool yeah i know <laughs> i was there before it was trending i was there before that everyone was blogging cool about it before people knew it was cool <laughs> <laughs> it's like how 90s fashion is in and again you, and you could even say like the people that think it's cool and they blog about it i taught them yeah yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so kudos to you, Dr. Liz. So thank you so much. And thank you. Um, we're very appreciative that you've been so interested in the microbiome and the gut for so long. And you've taken the time to teach us in our community today. Well, I love that you're doing such amazing work, educating people all over the world. It's, it's really an honor to play with you guys. Oh, it's so special to interview people that um, 
definitely have studied this thing before it was cool before yeah. people like <laughs> us jumped on the bandwagon um no it's really really special to interview someone like that and she has such a wealth of experience and i hope you got a lot out of it so i would love to hear from the comments um what was new for you yeah what was new for you what, what did you, will you implement yeah tell us what you get implement and are you going to prioritize massaging your spouse in your to-do list? <laughs> What's on your to-do list? Um, it's so important, guys, that we look after ourselves in this day and age, obviously. So we definitely love hearing from our community members. And if you got something out of this, um, share the message. We love putting out this free content um, to help as many people as possible. So And remember to like and subscribe. Yep. We really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again for joining us for another episode. And we look forward to seeing you next week. 